Hello viewers, as you may know that most investors look at the past performance of mutual funds to shortlist and start investing in them. However, what they fail to consider is the risk that a mutual fund will expose them to. After all, risk and return are the two sides of the same coin. Accordingly, in mutual fund investments too, higher returns are generally associated with higher risk. So how can one calculate the risk level of mutual funds? and whether they are able to generate fair returns for the level of risk taken. Hi, this is Vivek Chaurasia and in this video, I will tell you about various ratios you can use to quantify the risk related to mutual fund investment. Some of these ratios can be used to evaluate the risk reward trade-off of mutual funds by gauging the risk adjusted returns and identifying some of the best funds. But while using this, it is vital to compare schemes within the same category and with relevant indices to assess correctly and identify their suitability to your risk profile. The first ratio I want to talk about is the standard deviation. Standard deviation is a ratio that measures the total risk in a mutual fund. Risk in the investment world is basically a result or an outcome which is different from what is expected out of the investment. So something that is other than what was expected is a deviation and in the case of portfolio management it is referred to as a standard deviation. Standard deviation is simply denotes how a mutual fund's returns would deviate from the average expected return and depicts how risky the fund is. And when you compare two funds on the basis of standard deviation, you can consider the fund with a higher standard deviation as a riskier fund that is less predictable. So if a fund A has a standard deviation of 21% and fund B has a standard deviation of 23%, it means fund B is more volatile compared to fund A and will be a riskier fund suitable for investors willing to take a higher risk. So you can use this measure to evaluate the level of risk the fund carries and compare it with the peers and the benchmark. The next is the Sharp Ratio. Sharpe ratio is a commonly used ratio to measure and compare the risk adjusted returns of two or more similar funds. This ratio indicates the return a fund is able to generate compared to the level of risk taken. While calculating a Sharpe ratio, we consider the difference between the returns of the investment and the risk free return and divide it by the standard deviation of the instruments or a fund. By looking at the Sharpe ratio, you can assess the level of returns generated by the fund in addition to the risk-free instruments such as the 10-year GSEC bonds and compare it with the standard deviation that is the total risk taken by the fund to generate returns. Simply put, the higher the Sharpe ratio, the better is the fund's ability to reward investors with higher returns for the level of risk taken. If a fund's standard deviation is higher, it needs to earn a higher return to justify the excess risk taken. If it is unable to do so, it means the fund has delivered lower risk adjusted returns and so a lower Sharpe ratio. The Sharpe ratio can be used to compare the outperformance or the underperformance of a mutual fund vis-a-vis -vis its peers and the benchmark index. The table here shows that though the fund A has generated higher returns of 23.4% compared to fund B's return of 20.5%, it has been able to do so by taking higher risk, that is, the standard deviation of 18%. From a risk reward perspective, as denoted by the Sharpe ratio, both the funds are similar. This means there is no additional advantage of choosing fund A over fund B. Now take another case where fund X has generated higher returns of 22% compared to fund Y's returns of 20%. At the same time, it has taken a higher risk that is the standard deviation of 18% compared to 15% of fund Y. From a risk reward perspective, fund Y has a higher Sharpe ratio of 0.93% despite a relatively lower return of 20%. This means fund Y has generated a better risk adjusted return compared to fund X and hence can be chosen over fund X. Ideally, one should pick a mutual fund scheme that does not chase high returns by exposing investors to very high risk. The third ratio is the Sortino ratio. 
The Sortino ratio is a helpful measure to determine a fund's ability to contain the downside risk, especially during depressed market conditions. Where the fund's returns are below a minimum threshold such as risk-free returns or deliver negative returns. Unlike the Sharpe ratio, Sortino uses only downside deviation or as we can say the standard deviation of negative returns to calculate risk-adjusted returns. As mutual fund investments are subject to market risk, they come with possible downside risk. However, some schemes have a better ability to manage the downside risk and thereby optimize the returns. Thus, the Sortino ratio can be considered as important ratio to measure the risk-adjusted returns. Like Sharpe ratio, even a higher Sortino ratio means the fund has a higher potential or a better potential of earning higher returns by not taking unwarranted risk. In this table, fund A has generated lower returns compared to fund B. Whereas its Sortino ratio of 1.36% indicates that it has generated higher returns for the each level of risk taken and has a greater chance of doing better during falling markets and limiting the potential losses. The Sortino ratio is particularly helpful when the markets are highly volatile and will have many data points to calculate the downside deviation. Coming to the next ratio, the number 4 that is the Trainer ratio. The trainer ratio is used to determine the excess returns generated by the fund against the systemic risk, that is, the beta, that indicates the market risk. While the Sharpe ratio uses standard deviation for calculating risk adjusted returns, the trainer ratio uses the beta of the fund, which is a measure of the systemic risk, to calculate the risk adjusted returns. Ideally, mutual funds should efficiently manage the assets in the portfolio and compensate investors with a fair premium for the level of risk because systemic risk that is the market risk cannot be moderated only by diversification. The beta of a mutual fund scheme indicates its volatility relative to its benchmark index. A beta of 1 denotes that the mutual fund scheme will move in line with the benchmark. Accordingly, a beta of more than 1 denotes that the scheme is more volatile than its benchmark, while a beta of less than 1 means volatility lesser than the benchmark. While high beta stocks or funds can be expected to do well in arising markets, they can also fall during market corrections. As mutual funds aim to outperform the underlying market index, the trainer ratio can be a useful ratio for assessing the scheme's performance vis-a-vis -vis its benchmark. In this table, both Fund X and Fund Y has generated similar returns of 18%. However, Fund X has a higher beta compared to Fund Y, due to which the trainer ratio is lower than the Fund Y. This means the returns of Fund X have come from investing in a portfolio of highly volatile stocks, whereas Fund Y has generated similar returns with a portfolio of less volatile stocks. Like other risk adjusted return ratios, a fund with a higher trainer ratio can be considered better as it has generated higher returns for each level of risk it has taken. Even this ratio helps you compare different funds and shortlist the one that could be suitable for your risk profile. Now coming to ratio number 5 that is the Jensen's Alpha. Investors invest in mutual funds to generate alpha or market beating returns with the expertise of the fund manager. The term alpha or Jensen's Alpha as we call it measures the level of outperformance or underperformance of the fund compared to the benchmark index. Simply put, it is a difference between the actual return of a fund and those generated by the benchmark index. So suppose if a large cap fund has delivered a return of 14% in the last one year, while the benchmark S&P BSE 100 index has simultaneously generated a return of 12%, it means the fund has generated an alpha of plus 2%. Simultaneously, if another large cap fund has underperformed and generated only 11% return, then the alpha of that particular large cap fund is minus 1%. So an actively managed mutual fund can have a positive or a negative alpha. While a positive alpha indicates outperformance, a negative alpha indicates underperformance. A fund with a neutral performance will have a zero alpha. That is, it is closely tracking the benchmark like is the case with the index funds. The alpha generation depends on the expertise of the fund manager and how well the fund is managed. So while the actively managed funds would be able to create a positive or negative alpha, passively managed index funds will not produce any alpha and deliver returns nearly in line with the index. 
In the last few years, many actively managed mutual funds have been found struggling to beat their benchmarks and are unable to generate alpha, whereas the passively managed funds have done better and have kept pace with the markets. So here is a formula to calculate Jensen's alpha. So Jensen's alpha is equal to the portfolio return minus a combination of the risk-free rate and the return premium as calculated by the beta into market return minus the risk-free rate. Simply put, Jensen's alpha measures the return generated by the portfolio above or below the expected return of the asset class. Now using this formula, let us assume that a large cap fund has generated a return of 14% in the last one year. Simultaneously, the benchmark S&P BSE 100 index returned 12%. The beta of the fund versus the BSE 100 index is 1.1 and the risk free rate is 6%. Thus, in this case, the Jensen's alpha will be 1.4% if calculated using the given formula. Apart from other important ratios like the Sharpe, Sortino and Trena, Jensen's alpha too is an important ratio considered by V mutual fund analysts to analyze which funds are worth recommending to the investors. The higher the alpha value, the more rewarding the option is. Talking about the sixth ratio, that is the information ratio. Information ratio helps measure the fund's returns above the returns of the benchmark index and even takes into account the volatility encountered to generate those returns. Information ratio will help you measure the fund manager's ability to consistently generate benchmark beating returns. The tracking error used in the calculation of the information ratio helps assess the consistency. The tracking error of the fund is the deviation of the difference between the fund's returns and the index returns. You can calculate the information ratio of the fund by using the formula RP minus RM divided by the tracking error. In this, RP is the portfolio return, RM is the market or the index return, and TE is the tracking error. Now let's consider an example where two funds have generated a similar return of 14% over a period of one year, as compared to a return of 12% by the market index, but have a tracking error of 1.08 for fund 1 and 1.05 for fund 2. If we want to pick one of these on the basis of their information ratio and apply the formula, the portfolio return minus the benchmark return and divided by the tracking error of the fund, it will give us an information ratio of 1.85 for fund 1 and 1.90 for fund 2, which means the fund 2 is better than fund 1. A high information ratio indicates that the fund manager is more consistent in generating returns relative to the benchmark. So a fund with a higher information ratio could be preferred over a fund with a lower information ratio. Now coming to the seventh and the last ratio on my list and it is the capture ratio. The capture ratio helps measure the performance of a mutual fund scheme during upside and downside market phases with respect to its benchmark index. It depicts by how much more the fund has risen during the market rallies and how much less it has fell during the market correction in proportion to the benchmark. It tells us how the fund has performed and how effectively the fund manager has managed the fund during different market conditions while handling the risk. Now capture ratio has two types to it, upside capture ratio and downside capture ratio, which is expressed in percentage. The upside capture ratio helps analyze the performance efficiency of the fund or the fund manager during the bullish rallies, whereas the downside capture ratio helps analyze the ability of the fund or the fund manager to limit the downside during bear phases. The upside capture ratio and downside capture ratio can be calculated using these formulas, where we take the fund's average returns during the upside or the downside period and divide it by the benchmark returns of the same period and multiply it by 100 to express it in percentage terms. Now let's apply the formula in this calculation here. An upside capture ratio of more than 100 means the fund has outperformed the benchmark during upside rally, whereas an upside capture ratio of less than 100 means it has underperformed. Conversely, a downside capture ratio of more than 100 means the fund has underperformed the benchmark during downside correction. Whereas, a downside capture ratio of less than 100 means it has outperformed. So, fund having an upside capture ratio of 130 means it has shown an additional gain of 30% of its benchmark during the upside rallies. A fund with a higher upside capture ratio has the potential to do well in a rising market. Similarly, a fund having a downside capture ratio of say 90 means that it has lost 
less by 10% of its benchmark during the downside rallies. A low downside capture ratio of less than 100 can be considered good because it means that a fund manager has been able to limit the downside during falling markets. Now applying this ratio helps us understand the ability of the fund to beat the benchmark during the different market phases. A mutual fund scheme which outperforms the benchmark in both up markets and down markets is likely to generate superior risk adjusted returns for its investors. So that were the 7 ratios that you can use to measure the risk in mutual funds and their risk reward potential to identify the funds that are worth investing. Though returns are an important parameter in selection of a mutual funds, while evaluating mutual fund schemes, you cannot look at returns in isolation. Understanding these risk ratios will help you critically assess consistently performing mutual fund schemes that could be suitable to you. It is important to note that many mutual funds tend to do well during rising markets, but the performance of most of these funds do not sustain when the markets show a reversal and correction. Thus, we need to factor in the risk involved and evaluate it based on various risk reward ratios to gauge the risk adjusted returns generated by them. While shortlisting funds, you should ensure that the funds you choose are compatible with your risk profile and match your risk appetite, investment objective and financial goals, along with investment horizon to achieve these goals, which could help you avoid taking any kind of undue risk. Also, it is important to keep a periodic check on how your funds are doing during different market conditions. Moreover, it would be wise on your part to not treat the past performance of the fund as any guarantee of the future performance. Hope this video helps you apply various ratios to make prudent investment decisions while investing in mutual funds. So stay tuned for more such videos and do not forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. This is Vivek Chaurasia signing off. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risk. Read all scheme related documents carefully.